Today we're going to talk about a variety of subjects in a new video series that I'm calling The Crypto Lounge. And I don't know if I'm actually going to stick with that name, so don't get too attached to it. Let me know in the comments if you like it or not. Uh, but basically it's a very laid back series where, you know, it allows me to upload a little bit more frequently because I'm not going to write a script for it. I'm not going to worry about video production. I'm not even going to worry too much if I say the right thing or I sound the right way. It's just going to be honest. It's going to be something where I don't take a million, you know, a lot of times with my videos, I have a lot of recording takes just to try to make it so that I phrase things the best way possible because people tear you apart if you say something slightly wrong, even though you might have meant something else, obviously. Uh, this series is not going to be that type of series. It's really just going to be unfiltered, me talking about whatever I want to talk about, usually going to be about maybe some articles that I read that I find interesting, maybe some uh, you know market updates that I want to release that maybe aren't interesting enough to have their own video. There's a variety of things that I might wanna focus on. Sometimes I might wanna talk about the finance side of things. Sometimes I might wanna talk about the tech. Maybe sometimes I'll want to talk about some drama that's going on in the community. Maybe I wanna play content cop, I don't know. This series really is supposed to be an idea where I can not have to stress so much about, you know, what exactly is the message I'm trying to send in a video. Because up until this point, every video that I've uploaded has tried to have a singular message that the video is kind of centered around. And even if I go into other subjects, I try to bring it back to that central overall theme. This is not going to be like that. We're going to be all over the place in these crypto lounge series episodes, whatever you want to call them. And it should hopefully be a way to easier connect with the audience and yada, yada, yada. It's just a way for me to upload more frequently and not have to always feel like I have to wait until I have a significant amount of content about one particular subject. So there you have it. That's the basic idea behind Crypto Lounge. It's kind of like, uh, you know, how Coin Mastery does his updates or how Data Dash does his daily updates or... Uh, box mining or Ivan on tech with his good morning crypto. It's sort of that type of series, except probably even more informal than those. So real briefly here, I wanted to talk about the market because it's been a while since I've talked about it, but I don't want to spend too much time going on about it because my opinion really hasn't changed at all. And that opinion, you know, I've had that opinion for months now, which is I still think we're in a Bitcoin cycle. I still think that Bitcoin dominance is going to rise. I still think we could see 50% dominance. And additionally, I still do not want to buy more Bitcoin until it goes down to 5,000. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't think it's a good buy now. If you have no Bitcoin at all, it's probably not a bad idea to pick up some now. But I don't want to pick any more up for my particular portfolio because, as I've said before, my exposure to Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, I have plenty of exposure. I don't want any more exposure at this point. So, I'm not going to buy any more until it goes down to 5,000 or maybe some event occurs that changes my mind. But otherwise, that's my overall stance on the market. I still think we're in a Bitcoin cycle and I still want to hold off until it goes down to roughly 5,000 or so. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to some articles that I found interesting that I've read over the past couple of days. Uh, one of them is this article by Jimmy Song where he talks about why Bitcoin is different. And in this video, or not video, but in this article, he talks about the idea that because Bitcoin was the first to offer decentralized digital scarcity, right? And the important word here is decentralized, right? Because we have been able to offer digital scarcity, but it's always been centralized. So theoretically, at any point, that could be changed. Uh, decentralized digital scarcity means that you can't really change that scarcity element without having mass consensus among a bunch of nodes, which is very difficult to do. Uh, so anyway, because Bitcoin offered that innovation first, it is real innovation. Most of these other altcoins are simply changing a couple of numbers. And as a result of that, Bitcoin has the network effect, right? It's the first mover advantage. Because it offers that innovation, it was the first one to offer it, everybody's aware of what Bitcoin is, and people will want to use Bitcoin over other cryptocurrencies because they feel comfortable with Bitcoin. And furthermore, he mentions the fact that because Bitcoin was the first, it has been tested the longest over 
years, right? Almost a decade now. Whereas most other altcoins have had a limited history, which means they haven't been tested to be as secure as Bitcoin. Furthermore, because Bitcoin's more valuable than other altcoins, there's far more incentive to compromise that system because you'll make more money. So there's a number of other factors that he really goes into here that discusses why Bitcoin has advantages over altcoins. He also discusses the fact that usually altcoins aren't really that decentralized because of the fact that there's some sort of foundation that controls most of the development or because it's an ICO, often there's a founding team that is responsible for most of the development and it's not really... You know, that team usually decides most of the decisions for that particular cryptocurrency, similar to, for example, Ethereum, which he does mention in this particular article, if I can actually find that right here. So he does mention a couple of things that really benefits Bitcoin over other cryptocurrencies, and that's what makes Bitcoin different. And I do agree with him in a lot of these, in, in a lot of the arguments he makes. Uh, he is completely right. Obviously, Jimmy Song is one of the smarter people in the space. I have a lot of respect for him. But there are some things that he doesn't, in my opinion, fully address. On one hand, he is correct that Bitcoin is, in fact, I would say the closest to the overall ideology of cryptocurrencies, which is that ideology was sort of born in libertarian roots, right? You think about the fact that Bitcoin was really became to be after the 2008 crisis. And honestly, I would say it became popular because of the 2008 crisis. I think that's really, I mean, Satoshi offered some technical innovations that made it more possible, but I think the interest was there because of distrust in the government, right? So as a result of that, we had this situation where all of a sudden the idea of decentralized currency is kind of a nice idea. So Bitcoin definitely fits that narrative, I think, the best of all the different cryptocurrencies. But one of the problems that I mentioned in my previous video is that by offering something that's fully decentralized, you are making some serious compromises that I don't fully understand if those are going to be something that people are willing to give up. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, just check out my last video. It's a fairly long video where we go into the big picture of how decentralization and mass adoption kind of fits together. But I just want to bring this up because, yes, Bitcoin is, in fact, different. Uh, but there are some other problems as well. You know, being decentralized, for example, and he mentions that in this particular article, that by being decentralized, you're not able to change things quickly. And that's evident by the fact that we had this scaling debate for years. And then in the end, we hardly did anything about it and pushed it off to these side chains. It's interesting to note that I actually think increasing the block size, especially to only two megabytes, really wouldn't have centralized Bitcoin all that much. And arguably, you can say that Bitcoin has some level of centralization in the form of Bitcoin Core, as well as arguably Blockstream. I'm not going to get into that whole debate there, but there is plenty to there, there's plenty of problems with Bitcoin as well. So, you know, I love Jimmy Song. I think he makes some very good points. At the same time, I hope, you know, that that people who read this, you, you have to be careful not to have rose-tinted glasses. And it's obvious to me that Jimmy Song doesn't have rose-tinted glasses, because if you go towards the bottom of this particular article, uh, you will find that he actually talks about the fact that it is possible to displace Bitcoin if you offer some type of innovation that to him is as big as Bitcoin is itself. Or furthermore, if you find some bug that makes Bitcoin insecure, I think that second one is a lot less likely. Uh, but I do agree with him, you know, tweaking a few variables such as block times or block sizes really isn't going to create a new cryptocurrency with a ton of adoption. And that's part of the reason why I think that Bitcoin Cash, even if there are some very good roots associated with Bitcoin Cash, which trust me, there are, I'm not saying that the people in charge, you know, the people at the top of the pyramid when it comes to Bitcoin Cash, they're messed up. But the foundation behind Bitcoin Cash, the ideology behind it, really isn't that messed up. I still think it's going to fail because it simply isn't going to have enough innovation for people to switch over from Bitcoin. That's my opinion, of course. But I just wanted to briefly talk about this because some people on this channel all the time 
when I talk about Bitcoin cycles, they talk about Bitcoin as legacy technology that is outdated, that will never be able to offer the solutions that people are looking for, and that altcoins are going to offer that. I completely disagree with that. Bitcoin is fully capable of innovating, and most of these altcoins simply don't have the teams behind them that are capable of doing true innovation and Jimmy Song kind of points that out. So I would check this out if you are interested. I will link this article in the description below. The next article I want to talk about. This is, <laughs> this, this is a funny article. I think this is a genuinely funny article. Because in this article, this guy basically goes into an absurd level of detail. And if you haven't seen this article, it's, it's kind of gone fairly popular. Uh, it's only been on Steemit for four days. But I believe it was on Medium from February, I want to guess, somewhere in that ballpark. It was, it's been a while that it was actually available, but then it all of a sudden got popular later on. But uh, you can see that this only been on Steemit for four days, and already in the course of four days, if I can finally get to the bottom here. Um, this guy had a lot of detail in here. Come on, we're going to get there eventually. There we go. So 50,000 views. That is a lot of views for something on Steemit. I mean, that's an absurd. It might even be on the top in terms of the most viewed articles on Steemit of all time. And obviously on Medium, he has a screenshot here that shows that it accrued 274,000 views. That's a lot of views for an article. All he talks about in this particular article is the idea that there is a cartel that is suppressing Bitcoin's price. And they've been suppressing that price all the way back since roughly in October 2017. But they really started hammering Bitcoin's price when the CME futures went live. And <laughs> I find this so funny to, you know, I get it, okay? There were certainly some things that were a little bit weird. For example, we had that situation with Tether where Bloomberg released some uh, article talking about subpoenas from the CFTC that happened all the way back at the beginning of December and conveniently were reported on at the end of January when there were a bunch of other events that were going on that were negative as well. So that was awfully convenient. You know, yeah, I do think that that was a weird situation. Do I think that it's purposely, you know, some huge cartel that's trying to suppress the price of Bitcoin? No, I obviously don't believe that. Um, Bitcoin was far overextended. I mean, you look at the move that Bitcoin had. I mean, you can even see that move here where we moved from $5,000 to $20,000 in the course of what, like a month and a half, if that. It was one of the quickest moves that we've ever seen, not only in Bitcoin, but any asset class in general. It went from being not an unknown phenomena, but like not relatively well known when it came to like general media, to being the number one thing that was covered on CNBC every single day. And even average Joe was starting to learn about it, right? So this is a situation where, in my opinion, it's fairly obvious that Bitcoin was overvalued. Does that mean that, you know, price is not being manipulated? Of course not. Price is being manipulated all the time. But it gets manipulated in both directions. It gets manipulated to the downside. It also gets manipulated to the upside. And I don't believe that there is some huge organization when it comes to, I don't know, news uh, organizations, when it comes to the banks, when it comes to the governments or anybody else that is trying to all coordinate this massive effort against Bitcoin to suppress the price, which is basically what this guy offers, or that's basically what this guy is trying to argue. And he makes some comparisons to other commodities, uh, namely gold, silver, and I believe oil as well, but I don't recall for sure. But it, it makes me laugh. He poses this question. Why does it only happen to gold, silver, and Bitcoin? Why does this type of manipulation or no, he doesn't call it manipulation. He calls it price suppression. Why does it only happen to gold, silver, and Bitcoin? Why does it not happen to stock bonds, ETFs, index funds, mutual funds, so on and so forth? And his argument, <laughs> his argument is that these commodities of silver, gold, and Bitcoin because if money goes into them, that is a sign that there is less trust in fiat money. Whereas if you have stocks, bonds, and all these other asset classes that he mentions, although these really aren't asset classes, but you get the idea. These other types of investments, they show confidence in fiat currencies. Therefore, there is an incentive to make them to continue to go up, but not 
gold, silver, and Bitcoin. It's like, I, I don't, I feel like there has to be a special level of conspiracy theorist to, to think this sort of a thing. It's not rocket science here. Gold, silver, and Bitcoin are all commodities. There is no intrinsic value in any of them. That isn't to say that they don't have value, just not intrinsic value. They don't generate cash flows. And as a result of that, they're going to be highly volatile. There's going to be points where Bitcoin, silver, and gold are in very high demand. And there's going to be points where they're in very low demand, period. There's going to be cycles of demand. And as a result of that, we are going to see massive fluctuations in commodities, whereas we are not going to see that in things like stocks and bonds because stocks and bonds are cash generating assets that also see cycles of demand, right? We see situations where bonds are in higher demand than stocks and we see situations where stocks are in, I don't remember what I first said, but basically we see situations where stocks are in high demand and when they're in low demand and vice versa for bonds. As a result of that, Right, We do see money flow between these asset classes, but the general trend is upward because, not because of this uh, plunge protection team that he talks about. No, it's because of the fact that over time, they create value. That's it. It's not rocket science. I, I can't even believe how popular this article has gotten. This is like... I, I don't know. To me, this kind of thing is it's all over the place. People saying there's all sorts of organizations trying to work together to suppress the price of Bitcoin. No doubt there are organizations trying to suppress the price of Bitcoin. There are also organizations trying to pump the price of Bitcoin, as well as many other altcoins. So it's a moot point. There's manipulation in the market. Is it really such a surprise? No, not in my opinion, at least. So, But this was an interesting article. It got a lot of traction, so I thought I would bring it up. Okay, uh, this is going to be the last one I talk about. I do actually have some other articles that I was going to talk about, but nothing that's that important uh, because this video is going on a little bit longer than I expected it to. Uh, I will be doing these in shorter form, I think, in the future. Maybe do a little bit more prep than this particular one, but again, I really do want to keep this kind of low-key. So anyway, the last thing I wanted to talk about here is this idea that blockchain is going to revolutionize the gaming industry, at least part of it, because... There's this movement that we are seeing in the gaming industry towards digital collectibles, right? We see like skins in Counter-Strike Go. We see skins in all sorts of different games. I unfortunately don't know too much about it, but I have a basic idea of the premise behind it. Something I'd probably understand a little bit better is like a digital trading card game. I think the idea of having digital scarcity in a card game and creating a marketplace is actually kind of a cool idea. I, I this is one place where I think the blockchain could very well do could do something very interesting in a decentralized way. The one thing I will note, this is obviously a marketing campaign in a way for Etherbots and that game sucks. Sorry to say it Etherbots, but your game sucks. There's no there's no reason to play the game after you see any of the videos on it, but uh, it's basically a game of rock paper scissors. It, it's not fun. But the idea of having digital collectibles is actually quite cool. And what I think would be interesting would be to combine a centralized like server or game, right? That kind of that makes the game actually enjoyable so that not every single interaction has to involve the blockchain because that's part of the issue here with etherbots is like every single thing you do requires a confirmation on the Ethereum blockchain. It just takes far too long. I think it would be interesting to do a hybrid system where you have a video game of some sort where all of the interactions with the game for the most part are done on a company servers. So it's completely centralized, just like the way most games work today. But when it comes to the digital collectibles on that game, try to interact with the blockchain. I don't know if you can do a hybrid system like that. I think that is where you would have to go to ever make this work. Uh, but because we have this movement in the gaming industry towards loot boxes, uh, I, a while ago I looked at like Activision Blizzard's uh, 10K and 10Q, and you look at how microtransactions have really changed the way they do business. We are certainly moving into an interesting economy when it comes to gaming, where I think that we could see a situation where digital collectibles could actually be a real use case for blockchain. So it's kind of interesting. Obviously, this particular article 
is really just trying to say, you know, try out Etherbots because uh, we offer something cool. But uh, again, you know, their game is not really anything interesting. It should be interesting to see moving forward if they are able to create games on Ethereum that have some real use cases. Because I remember looking at an article recently. Uh, it's been a while since I've looked at it, but most of the applications on the Ethereum blockchain that are seeing any use are games. And I think that makes sense. So should be interesting to see what that movement is moving forward. But uh, I just wanted to briefly mention that because I actually think this is something that could see some real innovation moving forward. And I would like to keep an eye on it. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I know it was kind of all over the place and I didn't really know what I was going to say beforehand. I just had a few tabs open and just kind of rambled on. I don't know if you like this type of video. I kind of don't care to be, no, I'm just kidding. I do care, but I do want to just kind of do this type of video regardless because uh, I think it's an interesting type of setting for me to do and it makes things easier. So, and it also makes it so that I can upload a little bit more frequently while I work on the higher quality videos in between. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. As usual, if you like the video, leave a like, comment, and subscription, and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you for watching.